probably the most significant news has come out of OPEC, or really OPEC Plus. On December 7th, OPEC and its partners, when you say OPEC Plus, you're really talking about OPEC plus Russia and a few others, a recent agreement to cut oil by 1.2 million barrels per day, which was a larger figure. Um, than uh, than had been anticipated, and and it's in the hopes um, that we'll stabilize oil prices. We're down now about thirty five percent off our four year highs we saw back in October. Uh, what are your thoughts about this cut and what it's going to do to the energy markets, particularly oil, uh, over the next year or so? You know, I think it's a, just a stopgap move. Um, I don't. I think even the the, the folks at OPEC uh, and and out of Russia, who's it's funny, Russia has more. More influence over OPEC, I think, um, than s- probably half of OPEC's own members do, um, which is which is kind of interesting and strange. Um, but yeah, I think it's a stopgap move. I don't I don't think, and I think they would would tell you the same thing. But it's remarkable. Oil oil is it's it's down by basically a third since October first, right? I mean, it's a massive massive drop in a pretty short period of short period of time. Um, I think it is going to kind of provide some stability, especially considering that probably I think the biggest source of new production has been the U.S. Right, the Permian Basin has just been pouring new oil out um, at like a you know a million barrels um, average you know annual growth for like two or three years now. But we're at pipeline capacity in that region, and that's going to carry out until you know late in the second quarter, or early. Or late in the third quarter, early in the fourth quarter of next year, before we start seeing pipelines coming on to start, you know, bringing more of that oil out. So I think this is going to give the market some of the stability that it needs to see over the next six to nine months. But there's a caveat. And that caveat is global demand, right? Um, you know, between the fears of a trade war with China and the U.S. potentially, you know, stalling global economic growth. You know, if if that weighs on, you know, oil demand. Um, if if the demand part of the of the of the equation changes quickly, you know the market could get another shock. Um, but if you were to to hold a gun to my head, um, I'd say a year from now, oil's probably going to be where it is now, or maybe a little higher. It's going to move a lot <laughs> in between now and then. Um, but I, I we'll we'll see what happens. What do you think? Yeah, as always with these global commodity markets, it's always difficult to predict what's what's going to happen. You know, we also had some some kind of unpredictable uh, uh, developments throughout this year. So we had, I believe, it was in Libya where we had had some uh, kind of militias shutting down some some wells there. Obviously, Venezuela's collapse has continued to play out. So it's hard to predict those right. sorts of things. You know, yep. a, as more pipeline capacity does come on in the Permian, I think we're probably going to get more supply coming out of there. And as you mentioned. If we see a little bit of a, of a turn down in oil demand, that that really could lead to an oversupply problem. The EIA has said that they, they don't expect shale production to slow, and that we may see some oversupply going into 2019, barring, as I mentioned, some unplanned outages like we might see out of you know, like I mentioned in Libya or, or Venezuela. So, I think it, it, it's difficult to predict, but I, I think I probably agree with most most of what you said there. Um, let's go to this other story out of OPEC. You talked about. Maybe Russia having having more control over over what's going on with, with that cartel than than even some of the members, and there has been some discontent among membership in OPEC. <laughs> uh, Qatar, uh, most notably, you can call it OPEC. It they left OPEC uh, after 57 years of membership, and their energy minister said when they left that OPEC is an organization controlled. Uh, is an organization managed by a country in a veiled shot at the Saudis. They've really had some right. some conflict with them. Uh, they're really trying to uh, Qatar kind of wants to push harder into natural gas. What do you think about Qatar leaving OPEC? Uh, is this signs of any instability in that cartel going forward? You know, there are some other countries that have showed some discontent the way things are going. Venezuela, Kuwait, Nigeria, Algeria have all been countries that have mentioned having some friction uh, with, with the leaders in in the cartel. I'll say right out. I don't think this is this is any sign that OPEC's about to break. I don't think that's even close to happening. Um, I think you have to look at the Qatar situation, um, kind of on an island, right? There's been some serious. It's been, Qatar has its own problems, and Qatar and and the Saudis have got. I mean, there's some serious some serious issues. But also, I think if you look at Qatar, you know, I don't think a lot of people really understand that. You know, what Qatar is really a natural gas producer, right? That's that's a that's a that's a significant part of of, of what they do. Um, so, I, I 
honestly, I think it's going to get the benefits of, of, of having, you know, geographically being in that same region uh, with most of OPEC um, and OPEC's actions. And it's going to have a little more freedom um, being separate separate from the uh from the cartel especially in terms of its um its uh its oil production but again natural gas and natural gas liquids are a bigger part of its business i don't i don't think it's it's eh, i think it's probably a little a little more noise than signal uh in terms of what it really means for opec sure jason and just to, to mention for our listeners with qatar pulling out of opec you know their production is significant. Their oil production is significant, but it, it's not the type of th- them not coming along with the cut that OPEC is doing and leaving the what the cartel is right. doing there. It's not going to significantly significantly impact global demand to really really mess up the supply demand dynamics we were talking about earlier. Right, right. And I think now from an investor perspective, I think this is the key thing. So if you think about uh, obviously from a consumer perspective, how this affects our pocketbook with oil prices. Uh, is one thing. But as an investor, I think the big takeaway is that if you think about what has happened over the past three or four years um, across the oil and gas uh, industry is that producers of every size, you know, the private companies, the, the stocks that we invest in, have, have just about, if, if a company has, has survived you know, the past three or four years, They've done it because they've found a way to lower their production costs. You know, they, they're they're drilling cheaper, they're they're maintaining wells uh, at lower costs. They're they're finding ways to to be more efficient with how they how much they produce, and that's the key, right? I mean, I think if you find that oil companies that are able to produce, you know, that are looking at like forty dollars for their break even, like I know that's a number that Conoco Phillips talks about. Um, you know, understanding how oil prices affect the economics of individual companies is really the key thing. And and invest in the if you're if you're going to invest in the sector and production, find your low cost leaders, and 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 that's where you're going to own a company that's going to be able to thrive at fifty or sixty dollar oil and is not going to struggle if we do so. Oil fall back into the forties or even lower. 